He is known everywhere that men have been. In old Greece, in old Rome, he flourishes in Germany all over, in France, in India, even in the Chersonese, and in China, so far from us in all ways, there even is he. He has followed the wake of the berserker Icelander, the devil-begotten Hun, the Slav, the Saxon, and the Magyar. The vampire lives on and cannot die by mere passage of time. He can flourish when that he can fatten on the blood of the living. Go! <sighs> Excuse me. I thought you were a vampire for a moment. <laughs> well, welcome to my book den. This is Charles Classic Vlog, and I am your host, Charles Q. Banks, dedicated to reviewing classic literature throughout the ages. And today, after two weeks of much toil on my part, and two weeks of, I'm sure, anxious waiting on yours, for which I'm eternally sorry, I shall at long last be reviewing Bram Stoker's Dracula. Cue the scary music. Thank you, Beethoven. Now, before I get started, I must let you know that this review is going to be published in two parts. Because I tell you, it has been quite the ch major challenge to actually review this son of a gun, this literary monster called Dracula. But why, you ask? Why is it so difficult, Charles? I'm glad you did. The answer is threefold. Firstly, it is easy to find ways to describe why you hate something, but much harder to describe why you love something, and this is a book that I truly love. It is my favorite book in its genre, that of the gothic horror mystery romance. At least so far. I mean, think about it. Um, if you see, like, a beautiful vista, a beautiful mountain range, and someone at walks up to you and you say, Oh, that's so beautiful. And they say, why? Then what would you say? I mean, it's... Well, it's a mountain. What else are you going to say? I mean, the rays of sunlight are shining upon it beautifully, and the there's crags and there's details in it, and it's big. Um... But then, when you see something horribly ugly, <laughs> I don't think I need to illustrate that fact. So anyway, moving on. The second reason that there are so many, you know, issues that I had uh, in reviewing this is because of the absolute multiplicity of misconceptions about this book and its content that really needs to be addressed before I can actually review it, such as what is the actual story, um, the, you know, so many books and fan fiction and movies and television about vampires has been made, but what does Dracula have to say about it? Um, and then Dracula's powers are completely different in this, Dracula's personality, um, the entirely overlooked Christian moral of the story, on top of the things I would normally review, such as the plot and the characters and the writing style, etc., etc., etc. This is all a big pill for you to swallow and a big pill for me to cook up for you. Now, the third reason why it's been hard for me to review this is because the subject matter and characters, typically vampires and Catholicism, are so massive, so important, to not only our present-day pop culture, but also for almost every culture all throughout history, as you may have heard me reading from the book earlier, the vampire is in every culture and every nation in the world. Almost. Uh, so therefore, in this part, part one, I shall only be dealing with the history and the popular depictions of the vampire up until... Bram Stoker wrote Dracula. And in the next part, part two, of course, I shall be actually reviewing the book, trotting out all the usual suspects, and giving you my own opinions and conclusions about the book. 
So, let's begin. I shall start with my history and experience being introduced to the book, which is in itself sort of an exodus uh, in itself. Now, let me tell you, there are many opinions, expectations, and ideas about what a vampire is, and especially Dracula, and I was no exception when it came to reading the book. I even steered completely clear of it when I saw it in stores due to the horrible reputation that Dracula has, um, even though I knew it was a classic novel, and that really made me want to read it. Um, but I had believed, like most everyone else who has ever heard of a vampire or seen one trotting down the street during Halloween, um, that like most other vampire stories, it was a smutty book, to quote Music Man. This sort of exploitative sexual content, this bodice-breaking uh, stereotype of Dracula, the idea that the morally ambiguous vampire has to break down the protagonist's moral fibers so that she can become free to experience passion in love, and all of that is, in my opinion, the scraping of the bottom of the literary barrel, so to speak. And I never read Dracula until last year because of that issue. But that was only until my sister, an authority on all literature, and just as scrupulous as I am about those sorts of things, she recommended it to me, having read it herself. Not only that, but an another friend recommended um, the podcast Hardcore History. Now hang in there with me. This does relate, I promise. Um, so Hardcore History by uh, Dan Carlin, which I highly recommend to anyone even slightly interested in history or sociopolitics. Um, I'll probably put a link to it somewhere in, in this so that you too can experience the excellence of the podcast. So anyway, um, in the podcast of Hardcore History, Dan Carlin was speaking about World War II and how communication and propaganda was one of the major game changers of the war uh, in contrast to World War I uh, because of the immense increase of technology compared to that time. And uh, he referenced Dracula to prove that point. He spoke of it as being a book he read frequently, uh, every single year, he said, which is, you know, shows how much you really like something. If, you know, I sometimes try to read the Chronicles of Narnia or Lord of the Rings every year, but I rarely even end up doing that, and I, those are my favorite books. Uh, but he, he's really, you know, passionate about this one. So that said something in itself. But he said, more importantly, that it carried in its main themes, in the crux of the story, the idea of the power of communication and misinformation, and the fact that the most frightening thing about Dracula, about the vampire in Dracula, was that the antagonist had lived for hundreds of years and had spent all that time learning from his mistakes and his opponents and perfecting his way of life. And uh, his point was that, you know, nations which are made up of tons of ideologies and thought processes and political leaders that are intelligent or not so intelligent, who are, you know, to be praised as high moral characters or to be shunned because of tyranny, um, nations should have that uh, exact trait that they, since they existed for so long, even America, which has existed for barely over, you know, 200 years, uh, it should learn by its mistakes by now, and even going into World War II, he was positing that America made a lot of mistakes um, getting into it. Now, that's that's not the point of this review, and, you know, I could agree or disagree. It was a very interesting podcast, but the point is Dracula. I'd never heard those types of things about Dracula 
ever before, and they really interested me. So after that, after my sister, after my friend, Dr. Dan Carlin, I dove into it, willing to stop if need be, if it got too violent or erotic. But oddly enough, it never did. I was shocked. Sure, there was blood and violence. That's kind of comes with the territory. But that was never the focus. And as for the eroticism, the supposed eroticism, a character was said to be sensual or voluptuous only twice in the whole book. Writing about sensuous or voluptuousness in the book only happens twice, with no sexual scenes of seduction or vampire romance at all anywhere to be found. It was so refreshing. Now, the more I saw that the sort of thing that sort of thing wouldn't be happening in the book, the more invested I could become in the narrative. Didn't have to be afraid that something was going to pop up that was, you know, brought down the entire experience, which that sort of thing really actually does. And I soon learned to throw out all the expectations and preconceptions that I had out the window. And the faster you do this about Dracula, the better. So anyway, I read through it in four short days, I might add. It, it's a page-turner. And after the 342nd page, which is the last page, I was stunned at the quality of the story and left gasping for more. The atmosphere, the tension, the adrenaline-laced fight for survival in an Edwardian setting, no less, which is my favorite, caught my imagination in a way few books had ever done before. The only real one I can think of that did it in that way was probably uh, the one I mentioned before. Um, just, I just forgot it. A Woman in White by, uh, oh, just refer to the earlier point. But anyway, being happily discontented that no other book like Dracula exists except Woman in White, I thought back on my experience, particularly to my preconceptions before I read the book, and I thought, what the heck was all that? Why was I afraid? What was with all those references about Dracula as an erotic literary work? Where did it come from? And why is that what the movies always show and focus on, even? Because the book is nothing like any of the movies. If you've ever seen a Dracula movie, um, then throw that out of your mind. This has nothing to do with those, other than kind of the blood-sucking part. Um, but a, a few, I, I admit, a few movies have come close to the original book, source material, um, but none of them get the story or the characters right, both of those together. They always take one aspect, which usually isn't even there, and drive it into the ground, always focusing on Dracula as some sort of demonic Casanova. Well, I did a little homework on the history of the vampire and found out some things to answer that question, because, as the classic critic, that's what I am willing to do. I research it so you don't have to. Because <laughs> um, I love you. And here's what I found. First of all, did you know, did you know that Lilith, the devilish female deity of the ancient Persians, one of the oldest characters in any mythology in recorded history, was also the first ever recorded um, character to have been described as feeding on the blood of the innocent? Innocent babies, to be exact. Um... And so, when you put side by side the modern vampire vixen of the book Dracula and Lilith, the evil ex-wife of Adam, you see that in nearly all ways, these characters are exactly the same. Yep, the first vampire ever was a woman. Put that in your pipe and choke on it. Now, aren't I smart? George MacDonald's Lilith is what I reviewed last time, just so you'd have something to refer to in this video. Popular demand may have had something to do with it, but whatever. Now, if you missed the last review, I will put a link to it 
and it'll be found in the description below or to the right or wherever it's found on this page uh, so anyway so since Lilith since that time way back in Persian history um, apparently almost all the way back to the time of the biblical judges of Israel um, the vampire has since then been shown in every culture that has some form of written or oral record. And as such, there are way too many renditions of the creature to talk about in a review. Uh, there have been numerous mum mummified corpses discovered in leaden coffins with, you know, bars of iron in their mouths like this <sniffs> to keep them from biting people if they awoke as the undead, or had wooden stakes caught between their ribs or with crosses or other sacrificial, you know, sacred items cast over their bodies. The list of them is actually endless. Um, it is kind of a morbid study, but if you are interested in the specific instances of historical vampirism, the information is there to be found. So as always, I urge you to research these things for yourself. Just do it during the day. And probably with someone. And um, make sure you have uh, maybe a crucifix lying around, a wooden stake, uh, maybe a Bible. Bible would be good. Um, and some extra lighting. Yes, uh, do it early in the day. Um, maybe don't do that, just leave it to me. Anyway, it is interesting to note that most of the records of vampire stories depicted the monsters as mindless or slow-moving killers who no longer had any will of their own to speak of. Which, you know, if you're thinking about that, you're thinking, zombie, modern-day zombie, and you'd be correct. The vampire, the ancient Lilithine, if I can coin that term, uh, feminine vampire, actually inspired the modern-day interpretation of the zombie. Yep. The first zombie was a vampire. The depictions kept getting more and more sophisticated as time went on, but most instances of vampirism were expressed in superstitious traditions or folk tales. Up until the 18th century, when people started writing more and more about edgier and edgier things, um, aka the Romantic movement. But it wasn't until 1819 that the whole vampire genre actually became more popular. Um, you probably haven't heard of him, but John W. Palidori, Polidori, an Englishman, strangely enough, wrote the short fiction work The Vampire, with a Y, remember that, and he is the one who cast the bloodsucker as a seductive and aristocratic uh, vampire that we know him of today, and he based his depiction off of Dracula, and get this, off his writing buddy, Lord Byron, the infamous perverted poet of the Victorian era, inspiring young people to become hobo poets since the 1780s. Don't you love him? Uh, this shorty, uh, shorty, um, short 80-page novelette was widely, widely read, I'm losing my speech, and it is even said that Polidori was the father of the vampire fiction genre. Yes, the first famous vampire, other than Lilith, was modeled after Lord Byron. Put that in your pipe and choke on it. I certainly did. Um, so anyway, after that, after Polidori's uh, The Vampire, A Tale, more and more lesser-known vampire books were published by lesser-known authors, and more and more people associated vampires with the likes of Lord Byron, who had multiple wives and heaven knows how many other es escorts. Now the next vampire story to hit it big was even worse, and um, that was entitled Carmilla, written by an Irishman named Sheridan Le Fanu, sounds very Irish, about a woman who was slowly seduced by a female vampress named Carmilla. Yep, you heard right. The second ever big vampire novel was about lesbianism. Put that in your pipe and throw it out the window.
No wonder vampires are always seen in a smutty light. I mean, this was the 1800s. What were they thinking? A time of tight corsets and tight-lipped businessmen of racism and bigotry. At least, we think. But at the same time, it was the time of romanticism, in which artistic expression was becoming more and more the norm. So, by the time Bram Stoker wrote and published Dracula in 1897, beautiful book, all of the worst depictions of vampires imaginable, even by today's standards, had already been published. Well, except for, you know, the travesty of teen vampire romance. But that took a level of depravity only modern immorality could come up with. And uh, I'll talk about that more in the next part. But that brings us to good old Bram Stoker. After all the years of mankind exploring the possibilities of the slutty vampire romance, Abraham Stoker, yes, that was his original name, Abraham, Bram, Abraham, Bram, a Protestant philosopher and theater critic with a past of illness, which he overcame by becoming a great athlete, and uh, those years of illness probably inspired a lot of the gothic horror-ness that he wrote later, um, he just wanted to write a thrilling gothic horror novel, written in the same gothic style as The Woman in White, which I keep raving about, um, which I highly recommend. Again, just remember it. So that's what he did, and he succeeded in making a thrilling book. He didn't have any ulterior motives, no metaphors, no allegories to stuff into his narrative, just a good old-fashioned page-turner which he eventually took to his favorite medium, the stage. And boy, did he succeed. It took him a few years to get off the ground. But when this book found its way into the hands of the public, it took off in terms of popularity in a way the previous incarnations of vampires had never done before. The vampire, nor Carmilla, never reached that popularity. But why? Why was Dracula so different? What is it about this incarnation that's so great? And that's the question that I shall answer next time in my continuing review of Bram Stoker's Dracula. Now, do not fret. It shan't take as long as this one did to get it posted, for I've had time to collect my thoughts. So, that's it for now. Thanks for watching. If you liked this video, like it and share it so that this show may go on. Keep reading, my friends. Keep reading. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have a review to finish. Goodbye. I said goodbye. Yes, goodbye.